Well, thank you for joining me for part two of our chat about fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Right now we're gonna be talking about how do we recognize um, patients with different fluid and electrolyte imbalances, and then what do we do about it when patients have these imbalances? Now, in terms of what we're gonna do first is we're gonna take a good history on our patient. And so, um, you know, really the symptoms of fluid and electrolyte imbalance are not really very specific and sometimes they can be vague. So you really have to take into context everything that the patient tells you um, in, in also keeping in mind what risk factors they might have for them in terms of what imbalance may be present. But some red flags about risk factors should, that you should be aware of are things like a history of vomiting, diarrhea, or organ failure, like kidney, heart, or liver failure. If they have any vague, unexplained nausea, fatigue, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle cramping, edema, or sudden changes of weight should alert you to the fact that they might have an electrolyte or fluid imbalance that needs to be investigated. And when we're talking about our nursing assessment, of course, we're gonna do our full head to toe physical and then focus specifically on our vital signs because our temperature, pulse, respirations, and blood pressure can give us a lot of information, especially about fluid volume status. Now, our patients may need to be on daily weights if this is something that we're worried about and need to trend over time. We wanna monitor carefully our fluid intake and output. And we're gonna discuss that more in class about how do we do that. Um, because again, we need to be balanced with our intake and output to make sure those are the same. And then of course, the doctors are probably gonna order some lab studies um, to get some blood work that can give us some more information. Now, in order to talk about assessing for a fluid or electrolyte imbalance, first you have to know what's normal. So let's talk a little bit about what are the normal examination findings you'd have on someone who was a, had a normal fluid and electrolyte balance. So, you know, if I'm looking at you and you're very well hydrated today and everything's normal, these are the kind of things I'm gonna see in my assessment, that you're alert and you're awake, that your lips are moist, especially like the inside of your mucous membranes you have no visible swelling or edema, and that your neck veins are flat. They're not overloaded in big ropes on your necks. That you have no shortness of breath, no dyspnea. I don't see any muscle twitching. Um, I don't see any spasming of your hands and you can't open them up. That's very scary when patients have that um, sign of low calcium or low magne magnesium when they literally are spasmed like that, very scary. And you're not sweaty. So diaphoresis is a sign of high magnesium. I would also look at my, your skin turgor. Is it, are you showing tenting if I pinch your skin? Does it stay up? That's a sign of that you have a low fluid volume, hypovolemia. I would look for your vital signs and I would feel the quality of your pulses. So are your pulses normal or are they just bounding because you've got so much fluid in your vascular space that I'm just feeling it like crazy? Or is it really hard to get a good pulse and it's thready and weak because there's just not a lot of fluid volume in your artery? And then I would wanna look for intake and output. Oliguria, meaning uh, lack of urination, is a sign of a fluid volume deficit because your body is not gonna let go of that little bit of fluid that it still has. I would wanna check your weight and compare, especially if there's any significant weight gains or losses over a period of just a day or two. And then looking at a mental status examination, are you alert and oriented times three or four? Um, because cerebral impairment happens with low sodium and high sodium levels. And then finally, I would look for things like your muscle strength. Flaccid muscles are those like loose, weak muscles, and they can occur with imbalances in your potassium. We can check for reflexes because you will not have good reflexes if you have hypermagnesemia or hyperkalemia, or cal calcemia. And then you'd check for a few um, signs of hypercalcemia and hypermagnesium called the Chosvec signs and the Trousseau signs. And I've got a link down in the description box of an example of those. So why don't you click on that just now? It takes about a minute to see that. 
So then we need to think about um, the type of fluid imbalance we're talking about. Are they hypovolemic? Are they lacking fluid? Are they hypervolemic? They're too much fluid. And where is that fluid? Do you have enough fluid going through your veins and arteries? Or is it all like just hanging out in the tissues? Because quite frankly, the fluid hanging out in the tissues isn't going back to the heart and getting oxygenated blood that's gonna bring it to the organs, right? So we need good fluid volume in our vascular space. And when our, when our vascular system gets too leaky and starts leaking fluids out into the tissue itself, into the interstitial space, it's called third spacing. So the patient can have a whole lot of fluid, but it's in the wrong place because it's not in the vascular system. It's not in the veins and the arteries that are circulating our body. It's just kind of seeping out into the tissues and not being very helpful. So we wanna think about, is it that they don't have enough fluid or they have too much fluid or is it just in the wrong space? Now, in terms of electrolyte imbalances, it, what our symptoms and signs are gonna be is gonna really depend on which type of imbalance it is and the severity of that imbalance. So you really have to have a keen understanding of the hypo and hyper levels of all of these different electrolytes. Now I've put a another link in the description box below that's gonna give you a good understanding of this hypo and hyper um, electrolyte status and electrolyte imbalance. So go ahead and pause here, take a look at that one and take some notes um, when you're ready. And then I'll see you back here and we'll continue on. Now, certainly, like I said, um, all of these electrolyte imbalances can be a little vague and nondescript, not very specific. You know, diarrhea doesn't always lead mean from one thing and vomiting can be from a million different reasons, right? So the only way to really know if we have an electrolyte imbalance is to get some lab studies. And so specifically, we can measure the serum levels, the blood levels of all of your different um, uh, electrolytes, and you do need to know these levels. So go ahead and start memorizing these, put them on flashcards. Um, we can also do an EKG because remember many of these electrolytes impact the functionality of the heart muscle, the cardiac muscle. And so we need to watch those cardiac rhythms to see if they're normal or if the heart's starting to get a little bit irrit irritated from either low or high electrolyte levels. Okay, so we know fluids and electrolytes are a big deal. And we know that you can be either low or high in fluid volume or a specific electrolyte. And we know that there's some pretty bad consequences if these fluids or electrolytes get out of whack. And now we have a, some understanding of how to identify when they are out of whack. So now that we've identified it, what do we do? How can we help our patients? So we're gonna talk specifically about some nursing and collaborative interventions to promote fluid and balance in electrolyte balance. So the first one is primary prevention. Remember uh, an ounce of prevention, what is it? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of something. I know there's some cute little saying out there, but you get the idea. And prevention is way more important than trying to treat it later. So we're going to try to minimize risk factors and manage the disease. So, so things like patient teaching, dietary me measures, and fluid management. And so if you have a kiddo that comes in and they've been having diarrhea for the last two days, we need to do good patient teaching on, you know, I don't care if they eat, but they've got to keep drinking. And here's how you can kind of help your kids you know, maintain their fluid status or, you know, um, there's, we want to try to keep that fluid volume in and out equal. So if the output's going up from via diarrhea or, vo or vomiting, we need to make sure that that patient has their intake going up to meet it. So we want to try to help minimize risk and manage whatever disease is going on to maintain that homeostasis. Now, in terms of electrolyte screening and fluid screening, it's not a routine thing that we've done for the general population, but monitoring specific serum blood levels and even daily weights for, for fluid volume can be performed in specific disease management. And in terms of collaborative interventions, now the treatment is gonna really depend on what's the underlying cause. So if a patient is been having diarrhea for five days, and it's not going away, not only do we need to help push fluids to try to equal out their intake and their output, 
but we need to try to figure out why are they having diarrhea for five days? Well, maybe they have a C. diff infection and they need antibiotics. Um, so what is it that that underlying cause that's causing this fluid or electrolyte imbalance? Now, this can be things like water replacement th uh, therapy. It seems like when people go to the ER, almost everybody gets an IV. Everybody gets a bag of fluids. And so we can replace either orally or intravenously. We can replace supplements of uh, electrolytes, either orally or intravenously. And then there are other pharmacotherapies, medications um, that can act as those hormones to try to like dictate where water goes in your body. So if the ADH and the aldosterone's not doing it, you can get insulin in there and start yelling and, and, and kind of shifting things around or vasopressin, kind of yelling and shifting things around. So we can get some of these bossy hormonal teenagers into the body to help dictate what the body does with the fluid and electrolytes that they have. I'm gonna link another box below. There's a lot to learn on this um, and there's some really good content that's already been shared. And so down in the fluid, in the description box, there's one on IV fluids, hypo, hyper, and isotonic. So at this point, since we're talking about fluid replacement therapy, I'd like you to take a look at that video and take some notes and I'll see you back here when you're done. Okay, so you're all experts now on isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic solutions uh, from the other uh, YouTube video that you just watched. Remember, isotonic, everything stays status quo. It's not going to shift fluid in or out of the blood vessels. Everything just stays the way it is. Hypotonic is going to pull water from the intravascular, from the vascular system, out into the tissue. And then hypertonic is gonna pull from the tissue, from the interstitial space back into the vascular space. So where is your fluid is going to help dictate what type of order for fluid replacement you're going to see. Now, administering blood products is a very specific type of IV fluid and fluid replacement that um, can be done in the clinical setting. We're not gonna really talk a whole lot about blood transfusions right now, but what I do want you to hear, because you may have your patients on blood transfusions when you're in clinical, is that there is a risk for transfusion reactions. And this can be a variety of different symptoms, shortness of breath, rashes, fevers, itching. But what I need you to know is that if you have a patient on a blood transfusion and they start complaining of any symptom whatsoever, um, it's very important that you get your clinical instructor and the nurse right away because they're going to need to stop that transfusion um, and reassess the patient. Because if they're having a transfusion reaction, the last thing they need is more of that transfused blood. It's going to make things worse. So what you need to know now, if you notice any symptoms whatsoever while a patient's on a, trans a blood transfusion, get help, get that transfusion stopped right away. Your Giddens text lists a few more additional interventions specific to fluid volume. Um, we can talk about daily getting daily weights, especially if patients are really at risk for very big changes in their fluid volume quickly, like people like heart failure. Um, we can monitor fluid intake and output, making sure those are even and we don't have a teeter-totter on our intake or our output. And we can think about comfort and oral hygiene, especially if a patient has very dry mouth. And of course, patient teaching, because a lot of this involves the patient's um, you know, participation in their own health, in maintaining their fluid volume status and make, making sure they're taking their medications or whatever it is that's causing their um, imbalance or risk for imbalance. Now, there are a number of interrelated concepts for fluid and electrolytes, which you can see here. Some of the ones we highlighted today were things like nutrition, hormonal regulation, um, cognition and perfusion and gas exchange. And fluid and electrolytes is very closely related with acid-base balance, which we'll be talking about this week as well. And as we've been adding these concepts to your toolbox, the more you know about these different concepts, it starts to really inform you about the next concept that you're learning and you see how these things all start interconnecting. There are a variety of featured exemplars in your Giddens text, uh, such as fluid volume overload or dehydration, the opposite ends of that spectrum, and then hypo or hyper levels of different electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And you can read those for yourself in your Giddens text. 
And finally, at the end of your slide deck, um, there are these two uh, different concept maps of fluid balance and electrolyte imbalance balance that really give you an idea of the definition, priority assessments or cues, things that would be um, abnormal, priority labs, and related concepts. And if you're a visual person, these are just really nice because they just put it all in one sheet for you um, and really help you kind of get an overall sense of the concept. So these are in your Blackboard. Um, as a, as a slide deck. And so you're welcome to take a look at those on your own. Well, you may not be fluid volume overloaded, but you might be brain volume overloaded. This is a big topic. There's a lot to cover here. But the good news is this is a main topic, a major topic in nursing education. And there's a lot of really nice resources out there for you to, re to reinforce and enhance your learning. We'll be doing that in class to go over this and really making it stick. But I'm also going to leave a variety of different resources in the description box if you're watching this on YouTube or on your Blackboard um, page and your pre-class um, folder to give you some additional um, learning supports as you are trying to let this stuff sink in. Everybody learns differently, so I'm going to provide a variety of different learning tools. And you might find a tool that works really well for you. And if so, be sure to share that with your classmates. That's all I have for now. I'll see you next time.